You're listening ad-free on Wondery Plus. From Wondery, I'm Lindsey Graham, and this is American Scandal. On October 10, 1973, Spiro Agnew stepped down as the Vice President of the United States after pleading no contest to a charge of felony tax evasion. Agnew's resignation was the centerpiece of a tense political compromise. Federal prosecutors had amassed evidence showing that Agnew took kickbacks from government contractors while serving in elected office, stretching all the way back to his days as a politician in Baltimore County. But as prosecutors were building their criminal case, the Nixon administration found itself gripped by a separate and unrelated crisis. Watergate was growing into an unprecedented political scandal, and it appeared that President Nixon's days in office were numbered. So with the possibility that Vice President Agnew, an alleged criminal, could take over as president, officials at the Justice Department scrambled to strike a deal, one that would force Agnew out of office while allowing him to avoid any jail time. Agnew's resignation came as a shock to the country. And his downfall was only magnified when, less than a year later, President Nixon resigned from office himself in the fallout from Watergate. Proof of corruption at the highest levels of government left many Americans feeling bitter and disillusioned with the political process. And in the decades since, public trust in government has continued to erode, a trend that, according to my guest Richard Brefault, may pose a threat to American democracy. Rafalt is a professor at Columbia University Law School and specializes in government ethics and campaign finance. He's written extensively about political corruption and is the author of Dollars and Democracy, which lays out a plan for large-scale reforms of campaign finance. Our conversation touches on a wide array of issues surrounding political corruption, and Rafalt offers a compelling analysis of whether the system is as broken as most people think it is. We'll also look at his plan to change the way we fund political campaigns and see if these reforms have the potential to restore the public's trust in government, if they're even possible. Our conversation is next. Richard Brefault, thank you so much for speaking with me today on American Scandal. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So right now, it would seem that the public's faith in our political institutions is at a low point. A poll by the Pew Research Center found that in 2022, only about 20 percent of Americans reported trusting the government to do what's right. And that number was almost four times higher earlier in 1964. Another Pew Research poll from 2021 reported that two-thirds of Americans believe that most politicians are corrupt. This paints a grim story of how Americans feel about their government, that we just don't trust democracy. But I wonder if that's a valid view of our current political state. Has there always been corruption in American democracy? I'd say there's always been concern about corruption. Uh, in American democracy. I think there's always been concerned about corruption in almost any kind of government. It really starts out with the idea of what is corruption, which I know we're going to be talking about. Corruption doesn't have a definition. Corruption basically means a departure from or a breaking up of purity or breaking up of the way things ought to be done. And we actually have a lot of debates about how democracy is supposed to work. So sometimes what people consider to be corruption is really democracy not working the way they want it. I think some kinds of corruption are pretty straightforward uh, when the government decisions are bought. And, and that has happened. And we see evidence of that really going back you know, to the beginning. But I think a lot of what you're talking about in terms of public discontent is a sense less that government decisions are being brought on a straightforward cash for decision basis. And more that government action is being pervasively influenced by some people, by elites, by wealthy people, by business, by different interests in a way that skews government action away from what most people want. I like the distinction you're drawing here between the different types of corruption. 
We just finished a series on the former vice president, Spiro Agnew, and his corruption was very transactional, a clear-cut example of what should not be happening in American politics. But you've argued that political corruption is a much broader phenomenon than this kind of quid pro quo. Explain that. Right. It's the concern about corruption. I think there's there's sort of two big ideas. One is the specific one, the kinds of things that we can criminalize. You mentioned Spiro Agnew, kickbacks, bribery, uh, people basically giving uh, money to government officials in exchange for specific government actions or government officials demanding payment uh, for doing things that, they, that they're supposed to be doing, but they won't do unless they get paid. Uh, extortion. Uh, things that, as you use the word transactional, I think that's exactly right. Things that are pretty clearly um, government decision, government officials making decisions that have nothing to do with the merits and based entirely on their personal gain. But then I think when people use the word corruption today or people talk about draining the swamp, they have, they, they're really focusing on something broader, the sense that government decisions, government officials are more pervasively influenced by people, by business, by interest groups, by uh, things that don't relate to the merits of a decision, but that are based on money or the ability to mobilize voters or the ability to you know, mobilize media in a way that is beneficial to the public official. It's not a straightforward cash for action transaction, but it's more subtle and more pervasive. Well, let's let's investigate the subtle and pervasive aspect of corruption on the ground, in on the hill, in the halls of power. How does this systemic corruption play out? Well, I think it's the sense that some interests get listened to more than others. They get listened to more seriously than others. When Congress writes a tax bill, or when Congress writes a, a regulatory law, or when agencies adopt regulations, they listen more closely. They listen more carefully to some groups than to others, and that the groups that they listen to are groups that have been have more money, they make big campaign contributions, they engage in lobbying, they might even be part of the same social or economic network uh, as members of Congress or as administrators, as senior staffers. And they get listened to more than people who speak for other people who don't have the same connections. So returning to the poll results I referenced at the beginning of this conversation, um, the American public has a dim view of our democracy and government, with the majority believing that our elected leaders are corrupt. But I wonder, are people justified in holding this view that our government is crooked? You know, that's a hard, again, it's a really hard question. There are obviously every, every year, every month, you may read about a new indictment brought against some kind of, some official, uh, which indeed shows actual criminal corruption of the kind you mentioned at the outset of you know, actual bribery, actual kickbacks. That definitely happens. I think, though, that that doesn't describe most public officials. I think most public officials are not taking bribes, not taking kickbacks, not extorting money. But I think there's this pervasive sense that government is run by elites for elites. And I do think it's very hard to disentangle poll data about what is it exactly that's making people unhappy? I think some views about whether government is corrupt is often tied up with views about whether people think government is working well for them. And if they don't think it's working well, they're more likely to think that there's corruption. I think it's probably obvious that um, given the public posture towards corruption in government, given that um, it is undeniable that the more resources you have to bring to bear, the more influence you will gain as you lobby your, your government, that the American people believes that the rich and powerful have more control over the political system and that perhaps that is why they feel alienated and that it doesn't work for them. Um, what kinds of threats does that sort of cynicism or pragmatism pose? I, I like the way you ask that cynicism or pragmatism. Um, the good part, I suppose, is that people are willing to not just trust things because the government says so. Uh, and to actually, you know, try and process it themselves and whether something government does make sense and it's the right thing to do. On the other hand, I think this kind of pervasive cynicism means if you don't trust anything that government or anybody says, it makes it hard to actually make informed decisions. I mean, you know, it makes it hard for people to know what are the facts? Uh, what's right? Is this working? Government may very well be telling the truth about something. 
But if you doubt everything, um, you know, then you're kind of at sea as to what, what, what are the right policies to follow, because the right policies will turn on whether or not something is working or not. If you don't believe the information, um, it's hard to know. So I do think there's something to be said for being you know, a little skeptical sometimes. But I think at some points, a kind of pervasive cynicism makes it impossible to, to engage in um, any kind of public action, any kind of public decision making. You've mentioned lobbyists, and we all know about them. The term lobbyist is, is loaded with negative connotations. Who are lobbyists and what do they do? Yeah, lobbying is a very funny thing. I mean, you're right. The term lobbyist is almost never used in a positive way. Yet, in one sense, what lobbying is, is the heart of protected activity. It's trying to influence government action on behalf of yourself or, or somebody who's hired you. Uh, it's basically, it's exactly that. It's petitioning government. It's speaking to government. and seeing they want this decision. I think it begins to get more of a negative rap when it goes from you yourself, you know, going to Congress with a bunch of your, you know, with people from your neighborhood or from your work group and basically trying to meet with your member and say, I support this bill or I oppose that bill. It's when you hire somebody to do it. So we usually use the word lobbyist to really to refer to professionals, people whose job it is to speak to Congress or to speak to agencies. Sometimes they are in-house. They're the lobbyists that work within a union or a trade association or a corporation. And sometimes there are people who are, you know, have their own firms or have are part of their own companies. They could be lawyers, they could be part of a public relations outfit. Uh, and they just get hired by different clients on different contracts. And they know how to speak to Congress. They know who to call. They know how to write a memo in a certain way. Uh, they know how to speak to agencies. They know the ins and outs of how the agencies work. And if you are trying to get an agency to to adopt a regulation that helps you or to not adopt a regulation that will hurt you, it's useful for you to have a lobbyist. And similarly, if you want Congress to pass a bill that will help your company or help your union or help your interest group or to block a bill that would hurt you, you might want to hire a lobbyist to help you make your case. So it seems obvious that um, if you have vested interests, you may pay money to gain professional expertise on how to interface and persuade Congress in your favor. That's one way you could use money to, to gain political influence, but that's certainly not the only way. How do lobbyists and other organizations use money more generally to gain political influence? Well, I mean, lobbyists that, you know, uh, work on, of course, a range of ways. One is they have money just so they could do more research. They could commission studies. They can, you know, generate data that helps their position. So just by being able to, to, you know, to do a lot of research, to hire a lot of experts, you can actually develop a whole body of arguments that support your position. They also, of course, will go to fundraisers either on their own or they'll persuade their client uh, to make uh, campaign contributions to the members of Congress to political action committees, to political parties, as a way of, again, getting their foot in the door. Um, they may also you know, spend money or persuade their principals to spend money on public advertising, so-called grassroots lobbying, taking out newspaper ads or you know, sending out texts to people saying, you know, trying to influence the general uh, political climate, the general set of attitudes that the public has about a certain issue. You could call it public education but it's really an effort to influence uh, public attitude about certain issues. They can spend money on that as well. All this money being spent by corporations in particular, these are not uh, stupid people running these organizations. They look for return on their investment. So what is the evidence that shows lobbying pays off? Well, there's certainly some evidence that you can get a major return on your investment for a modest amount of lobbying. If you can get a certain change in the tax code, or block a change in the tax code, or even block it for a year. It, it, you, you can have really huge gains in, in some cases. And sometimes it's hard to monetize the gain because what you're trying to do is prevent something from happening. Uh, a lot of what lobbying is doing is really about stopping things. And that's a little bit hard to quantify, but it's likely that you're stopping things that could raise a tax, uh, could deny you a benefit, uh, could reduce the value of a license. Um, these can all be incredibly 
exponentially significant. There's a broad spectrum of political influence, whether it's signing a petition or calling your congressman or hiring a high-powered Washington lobbying firm. In this spectrum, more and more resources and more specific and probably selfish goals are achieved. On the lower end, calling your congressman feels totally fine and very well within your rights as a citizen to express yourself. The other end starts to feel, for lack of a better term, icky. Is there anything inherently corrupt about this arrangement of lobbying? Again, it goes back to what we mean by corrupt. From one perspective, this is all First Amendment activity. Any effort spending money to get your message to a member of Congress, to the Speaker of the House, to an administrator, that seems to be legitimate. On the other hand, as you say, right, if, if it involves uh, showering that person with gifts, um, arranging, you know, special um, retreats, special vacations, large campaign contributions, all of which stop short of saying, I'm giving this to you in exchange for your doing something, but creates um, a setting of uh, gratitude, of, of reciprocity, of good feeling on the part of the elected official or the administrator for you. Yeah, I do think that's a, that is what I think the public thinks of as as icky, to use your technical term. It's in that gray area where we're moving away from voicing your opinion, making your case, giving facts and arguments that show why your company ought to get this benefit to the point where it looks like what you're really doing is giving a special benefit to this elected or appointed official so that he or she will do something for you, not because it's in the country's best interest, but because they're grateful to you for the personal benefit you gave them, or they expect that if they do this for you now, we'll get more benefits from you later. That's where we try and draw some kind of a line. Let's turn to another area of perhaps um, systemic corruption, and this would be the concept of, of the revolving door. This is an interesting term. Explain what that is and how it impacts decision-making in our political system. Sure. Re the revolving door gets at the idea that at the highest levels of government, we're talking about cabinet secretaries and assistant secretaries, and maybe you know congressional staff, not that many people do it as a, a lifelong career. Yes, there are civil servants who are lifelong career people who staff most of government. But at the highest levels, people go in and then they go out. They work in government for a while, and then they go to the private sector. There are some advantages to the government, when this happens, you get some pretty smart, pretty skilled people who are, you know, you know, very, very sharp investment bankers or lawyers or other have other skills who, you know, may not want to make government a career but want to do some public service and are pretty smart and can help out. The the argument for it, I mean, it doesn't even need an argument, is expertise. It allows government to get really smart people, uh, fresh perspectives at the highest levels. The concern is that people who revolve in, shall we say, will be unduly attentive uh, to the, the views, the needs, the interests of their former employers, their former law firms, their former banks, their former companies, their former clients. Um, and then when they leave and they go back to their law firm or their company, they will have undue influence over the government officials who remain. That might have been their former colleagues or their former subordinates, and they might have some inside information. There's ways of controlling literal confidential information, but what they really know is how that government agency works, who to call to get something done, and what to say to them. And that's the concern is that there may be some pluses to this, but it creates a kind of maybe too cozy relationship between the regulators and the people regulate. Money in politics, obviously, as we're talking about, is, is, is something that could be discussed for, for days and has been discussed for centuries, really, as we try to get our hands around the issue of influence and what money can buy in the political or electoral process. So let's just think um, traditionally, where has money for candidates and their campaigns come from and what are they spending it on? Sure. I mean, the sources of money have really changed a lot over time as our politics have changed. If you go back to the period of the founding of the framers, 
lot of the money came from the candidates themselves because they were mostly wealthy people. The electorate was very small, and you had mostly elites running for office, and they basically uh, they engaged in something called treating. They would buy drinks uh, and put out banquets. As politics became more democratic, small d democratized, well, that didn't work, and other kinds of people began to run, you began to see the emergence of political parties. Uh, and really maybe for a century, a century and a half, political parties were the real fundraisers. And a lot of what they did was fundraise through the spoil system, through patronage. People who wanted to get jobs in government knew that the only way to do it was to, you know, was to support their party and that they would then be given patronage jobs when they got into government. And sometimes businesses also that were looking for government benefits would begin to support the parties. So most of the money really went through the parties. Um, and, and there was maybe less money because also the parties, a lot of campaigning actually involved labor. And that is to say, volunteers, marches, uh, more grassroots activism because uh, party organizations went down to the neighborhood level and a lot of mobilization of party people. This begins to change around the middle of the 20th century for a couple of reasons. One is the emergence of television. Obviously, there was there were newspapers before that, and there was mail before that. There was radio, which begins to change it. The television just is a much more expensive medium. And you also begin to have the emergence of kind of the decline of parties, uh, civil service, the end of patronage was greatly reduced, uh, and the emergence of candidates who are beginning the, the role, the rise of primaries, and kind of the breakdown of party control over the picking of candidates. And the, and the emergence of a much more individual candidate-oriented system, and one where, where you had to spend much more money on television. And of course, in the last 30 years, in addition to television, there's obviously uh, the internet and social media. So there are just more and more channels of communication. They don't wipe out the old ones. We still use newspapers and radio and TV, but we have new ones and new technologies which make it easier to poll the voters, to analyze public opinion, to slice and dice public opinion into smaller and smaller groups uh, through modern you know, um, data processing and information technologies. Those are all expensive and candidates all want to have that now. So costs have gone up in campaigning a lot and there's more money out there. We're a very wealthy society and people know that you know, the people who win our elections are able to set policy affecting the federal budget, affecting the oversight of the economy. So the stakes are higher. Uh, they've always been high, and they're just getting higher and higher. Where does the money come from? Um, mostly from donations. I mean, some candidates are able to self-fund. A small number self-fund quite a bit. Um, I guess famously, Michael Bloomberg, the former mayor of New York City, uh, both in his mayoral runs and his uh, brief presidential run was self-funding, um, but mostly people do it by raising money. And they raise it mostly from individuals, uh, either directly, individuals giving to them, or through political action committees, individuals giving to the political action committees, um, which then uh, make donations to the candidates or spend in support of those candidates. So that's where most of the money comes from. Um, there is corporate and labor money that's mostly, that's not as important. Most of the money is coming from people. Well, if I were one of those individuals, one of those people who decided to make a very large donation to a politician, as much as I'm allowed to by law, I'm imagining one of those very expensive $1,000 plate dinners or more, um, what can I expect to get in return? What you can most clearly expect is to get paid attention to. It's, it's beyond that, it's hard to say, um, and it might depend on how much money you give, and there are obviously multiple ways of giving. Um, federal law restricts how much money you can give directly to a candidate, but then you can give to a political action committee that supports a candidate, you can give to a political party that supports that candidate, you can give to a so-called super PAC, which spends independently, and there, there are no limits on how much you can give them. Um, I think what you can be sure you're going to get is get your calls returned uh, if you give enough money to get, maybe even get called, uh, but to get paid attention to uh, if you have an issue. 
Now, as we've hinted at, money and politics have been close bedfellows since the beginning of the government. But in 2010, the Supreme Court's Citizens United decision kind of upended the campaign finance system. What was that decision and what were the impacts we've seen in the years since? So in Citizens United, the Supreme Court struck down a federal law that had been on the books, well, in, in some form or other, going back to the 1940s, preventing corporations and unions from making direct contributions to candidates' campaigns. Corporations and unions had been allowed to participate in campaigns through what are called political action committees. A corporation could set up a committee and then um, individuals part, who were part of the corporation, officers and directors and shareholders, could give, could make personal contributions to the PAC, but the corporation couldn't use what's called treasury funds, corporations' own resources in a campaign, and same for unions. Supreme Court scrapped that and said, no, corporations and unions can put their treasury funds, not just ask for donations from shareholders or officers and directors, but actually use their own wealth in campaigns. The law still limits their ability to make direct contributions to candidates. But what Citizens United said is, you can't limit how much they spend. In other words, if a corporation wants to take out ads promoting a candidate or attacking a candidate and just do it on their own, same with unions. There's still limits in federal law on direct corporate contributions to candidates, but they can get many of the benefits of supporting a candidate by either engaging in this so-called independent spending or by giving to what's called a super PAC, which is, again, is an organization which supports or opposes candidates, but is, at least in theory, has some independence from the candidate. Increasingly, our super PACs are not really independent of candidates. But there is a kind of facade of independence, which allows them to raise and spend unlimited amounts of money. There's still not that much corporate money in candidate elections, but there's now a lot more corporate money, for example, say in ballot proposition elections, which occur in about half our states. Um, And there is increasingly corporate money on this sort of periphery of the election, the so-called independent spending. Um, In general, many people see it as given kind of a green light to just more money in our elections, and that's certainly been the case. Um, I think in many ways, Citizens United has become kind of a symbol of the role of large amounts of private wealth, both corporations and wealthy individuals, in our election campaign process. So that, I guess, is the large dollar scale of the side of things the very wealthy individuals and corporations who can now uh, have more freedom to spend as they wish, to influence as they wish. But there are many, many more small-scale donors, people who give $25, $50 to a candidate in any one cycle. How do those donations influence a candidate's decisions? Yes, you're absolutely right to focus on that. There's been a huge increase in the role of small donors uh, in the system. That's, in many ways, an, uh, an attribute of the internet. There was direct mail trying to get people to give money, but the cost of reaching out to large numbers of people to get small amounts of money was prohibitive. And it was actually very hard to get small donations from people using direct mail. But with the internet, reaching out to to potential donors is almost cost-free. So you can actually do that and you can send reminders and you can try and use your small donors as a political base. Um, And that can be very beneficial uh, in terms of reducing the dependence on wealthy support. There is some concern, and there's some support for this concern, that that the major beneficiaries, though, of the small donor surge have been extremist candidates. Not only, I think Barack Obama did very well, for example, with small donors. Uh, Somebody who's popular, somebody who has an attractive personality, somebody who might be a celebrity. But a lot of the the most successful people raising small donors, large numbers of small donations, are people who take very strong positions that are rewarded by voters either on the left or on the right who are really uh, have, have strong views and see this person as championing their views. I mean, to pick two extremes, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene and Al- Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez are the kinds of people who can raise large numbers of small donations just by being who they are, taking strong statements, uh, going public, and then engaging in outreach. Small donations can be used to offset the role of big money. The trick is figuring out how to get people to give you your small donations. Um, And are there ways of doing that other than taking extreme positions? 
So this is interesting to me, a new dichotomy. Um, what we have been traditionally worried about are large amounts of money from large corporations influencing policy. But now we have large amounts of money from very small but numerous uh, donations that don't go to policy, but go to personality. Well, I think personality and policy can be connected. Uh, some of these personalities are also very strongly identified with certain policies, but they can often be extreme policies. And they're often going to be on the so-called hot-button social issues um, rather than, you know, in some ways, big money had its most influence in, in, behind the scenes. Um, these are intense, intensely fought, very divisive social issues. Well, let's move on from the, the problems and, and talk about the potential fixes. Let's uh, start with campaign finance rules. You've described our current campaign finance system as, as one in a state of disarray, and you authored a blueprint for reform. What is that blueprint? Walk us through. Well, one thing is that I wrote that a while ago, and I think that increasingly the Supreme Court has actually made it hard to adopt reforms. But I, I think the kind of the three, let's say the three pillars of a campaign finance system. Uh, one would be transparency or disclosure, making sure that all of the money that's in the system is, or all the money above certain relatively low amounts is publicly available and reported on so people, voters, can know who's supporting whom, where's the money coming from. We have some of that, but our disclosure system has not caught up with changes in the campaign finance system. So one thing to do would be to significantly reform and expand our disclosure laws, our transparency laws. I think the Supreme Court still respects transparency, but our laws haven't kept up with the changing nature of political fundraising. Second thing is, some, is public funding. Again, public funding as kind of a, an antidote or a dilutive uh, to private wealth. There are multiple versions of public funding. A number of states and local governments have experimented with it. Some would give direct grants to candidates who raise a certain amount of qualifying funds. Others would use some kind of matching funds, but only, say, matching individuals who are residents of the constituency as a way of making it less likely you're just matching extremists, because extremists often draw their money from people well outside their constituency. And th this kind of so-called you know, matching funds um, can help candidates who are not getting a lot of corporate support get their campaigns off the ground. And we see this in now in a number of states and cities, and I think we're likely to see more of this. And finally, there's limits. And I think the problem is now, I think the Supreme Court has actually make it, made it very hard to have limits on how much money individuals can give to campaigns or spend on, on behalf of those campaigns. And I think if we could find ways of working within the Supreme Court's uh, hostility limits, that would be helpful. I think one way would be to think about have more realistic rules in defining what's an independent committee versus a committee that's tied to a candidate. But I'm not optimistic. I think when I talked about that so-called blueprint, it was before the Supreme Court had turned as sharply as it has against campaign finance regulation. So I think candidly under the current Supreme Court, and that's not likely to change anytime soon, I'm not sure there's a lot that can be done beyond maybe better disclosure and kind of voluntary public funding. Now, if I understand it properly, much of the court's hostility to limits are that, not that these are dollars per se in their view, but this is free speech. So uh, putting a limit on dollars is putting a limit on speech. This brings up the question about transparency, because I wonder if anonymous speech is protected. The court has still pretty much supported the idea that donations to political campaigns, at least above some threshold uh, amount, that governments can require their disclosure uh, on the theory that it actually serves the First Amendment by providing useful information to voters. Um, the hard questions for the court has been, how do we define what's a campaign contribution as opposed to maybe a contribution to uh, as part of a general public debate about some general political issue, that's one of the, the areas of, of legal uncertainty. The other is there have been some cases that suggest that 
if the threshold for requiring disclosure is so low, it does create a lot of paperwork, a lot of reporting requirements. It may be too burdensome for small donors and for a kind of small campaign. But the harder question is deciding what's an election campaign which where disclosure is permissible and indeed can inform voters, and what's a more general form of political activity where it's not clear how much disclosure can be required. So those are some ideas about how campaign finance could be corralled, improved. What about lobbying? We'll always need someone to make the case for what gets legislated, experts in the system. But is there any way for these specific interests to be curtailed more? That's a great question. I think there's some division on that, you know, in the academic world. Uh, in my view, is it's probably not possible to limit lobbying, uh, that there is a constitutional protection for it. I think you can do some things. Right now, we do have some disclosure laws that apply to lobbyists, but they're very general. I think we could require much more specific disclosure of exactly who is being lobbied, by, as opposed to, uh, say, we're lobbying Congress, and what you're lobbying about. Again, so that the public knows, has a better understanding of these avenues of influence. I think we can also have very good rules limiting lobbyists to lobbying, uh, limiting their ability to buy gifts, to buy meals, to provide entertainment, uh, to provide free trips, um, stuff like that. So we might not be able to limit their ability to provide information, but we can definitely curtail these other activities that lobbyists use to gain entry. Uh, Some states have have experimented with tighter campaign finance limits on lobbyists, limiting the amount, having tighter limits on how much they can contribute. Uh, And then another thing would be, of course, to see if there are ways in which we can have kind of more public interest lobbying or means of actually diluting the influence of lobbying. We probably ought to have more um, government, you know, staffs in our legislatures that we bigger staffs that actually help provide information to legislators that doesn't come from lobbyists, but that comes from, you know, the government's own research, from from congressional research offices. Um, And we've tended to starve, uh, you know, that aspect of the bureaucracy on the theory that we're saving money, but we're actually making our elected officials more dependent on lobbyists. So if we were to try to develop more expertise on a lot of these areas of, say, tax policy or science and technology in government that would help, and maybe even similarly to have uh, come up with ways of subsidizing, um, you know, various public interest organizations or think tanks that produce nonpartisan information. I think if you could reduce, you could figure out ways of reducing the influence of lobbyists by increasing the influence of other sources of information, that would be really helpful. So we've been talking about um, different brands of corruption in government, and in particular, how um, versions of corruption are baked into the system. What would be perhaps viewed as perfectly innocent uh, activity on petitioning your government on the other end of the spectrum becomes very close to unethical manipulation of government. Over and over, we've we've also um, bumped into tensions with enshrined rights of free speech and others that prevent us from making changes or even really well defining what corruption is. So I'm, I'm left with perhaps this is the, the final question. Should it be our goal to remove the role of influence and money from our political system? Or is there a different way to frame the debate to make sure more people have more of a voice? Yeah, that's a really tough question. I don't think you can ever can or want to reduce the role of influence, which is to say the ability of people outside government to have an impact on government. We don't want a a totally self-contained government that does whatever it wants. I think, indeed, the whole idea of the First Amendment is to make sure that it's provide, and of elections, is to provide mechanisms for for the public to have influence. And the public includes all of the elements of the public. So I do think influence is going to happen. Uh, and in many ways, is a good thing. We definitely don't want the, go- the government to be immune from public influence. Um, I think in some ways, a lot of the problems that we have in terms of unequal influence is a reflection of b- deeper inequalities in our society, uh, deeper economic inequalities that are going to show up in unequal influence. And until we are able to get a better handle 
on economic inequality in our society across the board, we're going to be seeing some unequal influence. So the kind of tools that we have in the world we have now of wanting to have open political system and an economic inequality are going to focus on what we focused on, transparency, uh, so people have a, have a deeper understanding of what's going on in government, and prohibition of the most the most corrupting tools, the, the most literal, most transactional or straightforward uh, interchange of money for, for decisions. But I think it's much harder to come up with ways of reducing the more pervasive influence of those people who have, are able to get their message out uh, more effectively and more often and to more people in government than those people who can't. Richard Berfall, thanks so much for coming on American Scandal. My pleasure. It's happy to be here. That was my conversation with Richard Berfall, a professor at Columbia University's Law School and author of Dollars and Democracy. From Wondery, this is Episode 5 of Spiro Agnew, Downfall of a Vice President for American Scandal. In our next series, we look at Abscam, an FBI sting operation designed to target white-collar crime. It was an unconventional mission, spearheaded by a lifelong con man. Abscam involved secret deals for casinos with federal agents pretending to be Middle Eastern businessmen. But as Abscam grew larger, it would also target local politicians and then even members of Congress and soon face accusations of entrapment. American Scandal is hosted, edited, and executive produced by me, Lindsey Graham, for Airship. Audio editing by Molly Bach. Music by Lindsey Graham. This episode was produced by Alona Minkowski. Our senior producer is Gabe Riven. Executive producers are Stephanie Jens, Jenny Lauer Beckman, and Marsha Louie for Wondering. Hey, listeners, you need to know that Wondery's shocking true crime podcast over my dead body is back for a fourth season, Gone Hunting. This newest season covers the story of Mike Williams. It was Mike's sixth wedding anniversary when he set off on a hunting trip into the gator-infested swamps of North Florida. He figured he'd be back in time to take his wife Denise out to celebrate, but he never came back. Friends and loved ones feared he met his fate through bad luck and a group of hungry alligators, leaving his young family behind. Except that's not what happened at all. And after 17 years, a kidnapping and the uncovering of a secret love triangle, the truth would finally be revealed. Enjoy Over My Dead Body, Gone Hunting on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen to Over My Dead Body early and ad-free on Wondery Plus. Get started with your free trial at wondery.com slash plus.